Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, September 28th, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not investment advice. This is for informational purposes only. I am not a registered financial advisor. I cannot give you individual financial advice. Please do your own due diligence on any ideas or information presented. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay. So one of the themes that I have been discussing in a lot of these videos over the last year was the fact that as we came out of the COVID pandemic, lockdowns, economic distress, that, uh, you know, that inflation that was created uh, central banks around the world reacted by raising rates. And so the Western world, the G7 countries, the U.S., Western Europe, they were the last governments to, or la last central banks to raise rates. And so we basically entered a rate cutting cycle last year. I've been tracking the central bank activities and a lot of the developing market, emerging market, Central banks have been cutting rates aggressively since last year. Last August is basically when the amount of banks cutting rates exceeded the amount of banks raising rates. And of course, this takes time to work its way through the system. Um, we were ahead of the curve. And I always talked about, okay, it's fine that these smaller economies are cutting rates, that our central banks are cutting rates. But we really need to see the big bazookas, the G7 countries, right? The EU, the US, Canada, Bank of England, uh, China, PBOC. Uh, obviously, the, the one bank that is still kind of not really cutting rates is Japan. We saw what happened about a month or so ago when Japan just raised rates just a little bit and what it, what it touched off with the yen carry trade. But this week, uh, China... Uh, a lot of people have been waiting for China to do something because of the economic crisis that's perceived to be going on there, the disinflationary environment they find themselves in with the bursting of the property bubble, plus some of the other uh, internal contradictions that a lot of people think exist in China. And so people were waiting for what, like, what's, the, what's the Chinese government going to do to counteract some of this? And so, you know, we've referred to, I, I do this, you know, euphemistically refer to the firing of these monetary bazookas. Again, let me reiterate, I don't agree with the central planning and, and trying to manipulate rates and money supply and all these things. I don't, I don't agree with it. I don't think it's good. Um, that's a whole nother discussion that we've had before. I'm not going to get into it. What I do understand is this is the way things are set up. And then what happens when these monetary bazookas are fired and these central banks are injecting liquidity into markets? What happens? Um, and so that's why we track it, not because we're wedded to it or we care what the Fed does. I mean, again, we go back to what Stanley Druckenmiller said, that in the short and medium term, Liquidity and sediment is what drives markets. Yes, over the long term, the fundamentals of a, of a company matter. But in the short to medium term, it's what liquidity flows, fund flows, what the central banks, if they're putting liquidity into the markets or not. And so that's happening now. And so one of the last ones, that's why I call it that bazooka. But what we saw this week, I would China finally reacted and laid out a whole series of things that it's doing. I call it the, uh, they fired the ICBM of stimulus. This is, in my view, way and above and beyond of uh, just the bazooka. And so this is uh, from a Reuters article. China's central bank on Tuesday unveiled its biggest stimulus since the pandemic to pull the economy out of its de deflationary funk and back towards the government's growth target. But analysts warned more fiscal help was vital to hit these goals. So what did they do? So the People's Bank of China lowered the reserve requirement ratio from 10 to 9.5. That's unlocking about $140 billion of fresh lending. They lowered the seven-day reverse repo rate from 1.70 to 1.50. Uh, for homeowners, there's a 50 basis point reduction in the average interest rate on existing mortgages. Um, 
They lowered the minimum down payment, even for a second home. They cut it to 15% to spur home buying. Um, this is what I think is really interesting in uh, these last two things. They created uh, the pay the Bank of China created a 500 billion yuan swap facility, which will make it easier for funds, insurers, and brokerages to borrow for stock purchases. And then, uh, and following on to that, 300 billion dollar yuan relending facility aimed at commercial banks, which enables them to lend to companies looking to buy back their stocks. So this is blatant interference in the markets, loaning money to buy shares. The stock market in China is at like the same level it was in 2008, I think I saw. And so this is a lot of stimulus, probably more to come. Will this work? Have no idea. Uh, but this is definitely uh, turn, firing the, uh, this is above and beyond a bazooka. I think this is big time stimulus. Uh, it will flow into the markets. It will affect it. And I'll show you how it did already and what I think is going to happen going forward. So here's another thing about the China stimulating its stock markets. So the new stimulus measures followed Tuesday's raft of fresh efforts from the People's Bank of China. Those moves included a half percentage point. I already talked about this down to this highlighted area. China's central bank also said it will establish a swap program to make it easier for companies to engage in stock buybacks. Further, Chinese banks will offer 2.25 rate on loans for stock buybacks and for investment firms to increase shareholdings. So, you know, the stock market for the average Chinese investor is not that big of a deal. You know, in the U.S., as I've pointed out, for example, I think over 50 percent of the households have some kind of holdings in the stock market, whether individual stocks or via ETFs or 401ks, IRAs and such. In China, I think it's like less than 10 percent. Uh, most of the people invest in property. And so uh, with the stock market being down, you know, and I look at some of these companies, you know, I've talked about China. If you recall, uh, I said that I was interested in China because in some of my analysis that I use from Google Trends, when I put the word uninvestable in there and have Google track that as a trend or, or, or send me send me examples of when it's used in the news, China kept coming up as uninvestable. You remember that. And I was hesitant to go there. You know, I like to buy things that are what I think are undervalued or mispriced or blown out that have some catalyst. But if you recall, I was hesitant to do that. You know, China was, you know, when I was talking about this even a year ago or six months ago, um, I was hesitant to go there because you know, I, as I reported last week, the Secretary of the Navy is being told uh, by the Defense Department, and she told the Navy to prepare for a war with China in 2027. And we're already seeing the, regardless of who wins the presidency in November in the U.S., there's going to be escal escalations and sanctions and other things. So I'm hesitant to do that because of that. I got burned in Russia. Um I didn't, because of portfolio construction, I didn't lose a lot of money, but I basically lost all my Russian investments and they were performing well. There was a catalyst there. They were undervalued. Everything was going fine. Nobody from Russia expropriated my money. It was the United States that did it, said that I couldn't invest there. And so you need to be careful because now this is on the front page, right? You've, they, they've got all the big pointy shoes on CNBC, China's undervalued. They all of a sudden decided this. And then you had this basically liquidity central bank ICBM fired on last week. And so now everybody's getting long China. Um, it's it, If you're nimble, it can be a trade. Um, but you need to be cautious because, uh, you know, the United States being the declining hegemon, this kind of plays into my thesis is, is going to be antagonistic towards China. That doesn't mean that you can't make money on, on a trade, but I'm just, you know, if you beat me next year on your returns because you were all in on China and I wasn't, I'm willing to accept that because I just, it's just too opaque. It's too centrally planned. And now with the U.S., you know, basically 
basically going to be shutting down, I believe, after the election, the whole Ukraine war and taking the focus off Russia and Europe and shifting it to Asia and China specifically. Um, and like I said, that esca escalation, sanctions escalation escalator has already started, I think. So you need to have that on your bingo card if you're going to be, this is a trade in my mind. If you want to play this, uh, it's just too, I think there's, I think you can still play a Chinese liquidity injection scenario, if you will, the bazooka being fired via hard assets and commodities. That's That would be my recommendation. Um, yeah, can you go buy Alibaba? Is it undervalued? Yes. They have $28 billion that, uh, on their balance sheet of cash. They're buying back stock. They don't need loans, but you know, other companies are doing the same thing there. Tencent, um, I can't remember all the companies, DJE. There's various companies that are really cashed up and, you know, they're still, their businesses are still decent. So they're generating cash and buying back stock. Um, and so if we weren't in a scenario where we wanted to have a war with them uh, and create this adversarial relationship as we get this shifting hegemon thing going, I might be uh, thinking about going hard into this, but I just... You know, I just caution you that you're going to hear a lot about this in the news and everybody's going, I, you know, copper's at 460 a pound. I mean, I can play it that way. Uh, you know, oil's lagging, but I don't think that's going to be the case forever. Gold is moving higher. I think this liquidity, surge of liquidity can be played via tangible hard assets and not taking on the risk I need to take. Can Alibaba double or triple in the next year or 18 months? It's very possible if you get the right liquidity flow. And if you have that, you, 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 you'll likely beat my returns, but I'm not, that's not the risk I want to take at this point. So here you go. I mean, this is a Chinese 300 index. You saw what happened last week. It was up 15%. Okay. Um, again, Chinese stocks are basically where they were after the great financial crisis. So these things are undervalued. China's not going to dry up. Does it have problems? All countries have problems. Is it going to dry up and blow away? No. Can individual stocks do well, even in an environment of, you know, yeah. I mean, if you just buy the index, that's one thing, but you can buy, you know, if somebody like Alibaba is turning their business around and doing, you know, kicking off cash and buying back shares, uh, I think you can probably get a total shareholder return. That's pretty decent. And uh, again, this is what happens when monetary bazookas are fired, or in this case, like I said, uh, monetary ICBM. Will this continue? I wouldn't jump in on Monday. I mean, this thing's already probably overvalued. I mean, short term overvalued, there'll probably be a pullback. So if you were going to trade this, I mean, you're looking at a double bottom here. I mean, if you're going to trade this, you might want to wait for a pullback, right? And not just, you know, jump right in on next week and be, you know, chasing the shiny object, if you will. Um, again, if they can, I don't think that this liquidity injections and these actions by the central bank and government are the end all be all there's probably going to be more coming down the line but remember the experience of japan they also went through a basically 40-year deflationary disinflationary environment and the stock market there suffered tremendously it's it's doing well now uh and i think it has some positive long-term uh areas but you know this could be something similar in china so again in the short term Liquidity and sentiment, has sentiment shifted? I don't know, but you got like a lot of big guns were out last week talking about how they're all in on China. And here's one of them right here, David Tepper. I think it's Appaloosa Capital. Uh, this is an article. He's all in on China. Uh, his words, not mine. It says, David Tepper is grow growing even more bullish on Chinese stocks amid the nation's new fiscal stimulus measures. Tepper views Chinese stock market as more attractive than the U.S. stock market due to valuation differences. Yeah, we pointed that out a while ago. It's a, quote, buy everything moment for Chinese stocks after the country launched a fiscal stimulus bazooka this week. Uh, that's their words, not mine. According to billionaire investor David Tepper, quote, I thought that what the Fed did last week would lead to China easing, and I didn't know that they were going to bring out the big guns like they did, unquote, Tepper said, referring to the Federal Reserve's jumbo 50 basis point interest rate cut last week. So we kind of talked about Mo Money Fest 2024. We've been talking about it for a while. Um, I got that term from a guy named Greg Weldon. Uh, he's a 
pretty successful trading guy. Um, he coined that term money fest 2024. I want to give attribution where it, where it belongs, but I thought it's kind of apropos for what we're seeing, which is, uh, this surge in liquidity around the world as all these central banks now we're in a coordinated. So here's what I expect to see coordinated, not that they sit down and talked about it, but they're all now cutting rates that increases liquidity. You're going to see PMI start to turn around. We know from data that I've showed you before as PMIs cross 50 and we get into expansion, what that typically does to certain resources like copper, oil, things like that. So I think, you know, that's where, uh, again, copper's at 460 a pound. Um, remember, we were talking about having these massive recessions. So uh, not saying it's going to go to five or six from here, but I think that you have, a, again, as we've been talking about for a while, these tailwinds now, you've really got the wind and it's time to really raise all the sails because you've got all this, all this different wind in your sails now. And so here's a, here's a, um, tweet from Porter Stansberry, uh, prepare for inflation. And I put up here why I like hard assets. You got to be intangible hard assets. What's he say? It says China just unleashed 500 billion yuan liquidity bazooka to prop up the stock market, interest rate cuts, more QE, lower bank reserves. Sound familiar? The People's Bank of China is now all in on stimulus, just like the Fed, because printing money always works, right? And then the last sentence, get ready for inflation. Yes, we're probably going to have another wave of inflation. And now it's time to start getting out of our T-bills and start, you know, deploying that capital in these hard assets. We're breaking out all over the place, gold, uh, silver, platinum, um, all these type of things. Emerging markets, I think, are going to do well. I've been talking about this ad nauseum, not only on this channel, but in interviews I've done. So, uh, uranium, I'm still all, to, all really bullish on that. We'll talk about that later. So, yeah, I think we've got, you know, inflation, the Cantillon effect. Remember, we talked about it in the February issue of the Actionable Intelligence Alert newsletter. You can read Cantillon's paper from the 1700s when he talks about, you know, how when you increase money into an economy, Back in his day, it was gold being as close as you could be to the king so you would have first use of that gold. You want to be as close to that money printer as possible so that you can deploy that cash uh, as a – because you don't know – the example that somebody used that's a lot smarter than me, just Dave Iben at uh, Coppernet Capital, that's like a, the Mississippi River. As the water is flowing down, a surge of water from these – headwaters in Minnesota and the Dakotas and all these tributaries in the Mississippi, if you get all this flooding or snow melt, this water surge of water is flowing down, but you're down in Memphis or New Orleans, you don't feel it yet. And as this huge amount of water, which would be akin to liquidity, starts flowing down the river, which would be the economy, you don't know where it's going to end up. Is it going to go over the, uh, the um, levees in Iowa? Is it going to cause a surge over here it's the same thing you don't know where this money is going to go is it going to go surge of liquidity going to go into gold is it going to go into emerging markets well we know from history what happens what has happened a lot in the past that as we see these liquidity events stock markets go up uh if the fed's cutting rates like they are they're going to be cutting aggressively in my opinion because i think we're not going to have a soft landing but that's another discussion uh that means the dollar is going to weaken what does that mean means real interest rates are going to collapse or, or start uh, going from positive to less positive or even negative. That's good for gold. Um, that's good. If the dollar weakens, that's good for emerging markets. Uh, so we know this from history. That doesn't mean we're guaranteed, okay? We just can anticipate some of these places where we could see. Uh, is it going to go into to fine wines? I don't know. Art, who knows? But uh, being that the world is $300 trillion in debt collectively, a lot of it in the West, by the way, it's print or die. So this is where we're at, guys. This is setting up basically very well for us. And if we we're in the right, again, then you have these other things that we've talked about, the underinvestment. It's just going to be, I think, I think everything is now, the train is leaving the station for what we've been talking about. You know, we've kind of underperformed for the last six months or a year. And you've had to be patient. We had to go through this. We didn't really drop too much, but we've underperformed the S&P. I think going forward now that we have these monetary tailwinds that we've been waiting for, they're starting to kick in, that 
uh, we're going to have a period of outperformance. That's what I'm anticipating. Here's uh, this is from the Financial Times, but it's sourced from Cross Border Capital. They're the ones that talk about global liquidity. Here's their global liquidity index. You see that it's turning higher. This goes in cycles, as you see. Um, you can see uh, we're at the bottom of the cycle, and now we're like launching. You know, we're heading up. So this is what I'm talking about. This is a longer term cycle. These things don't just go on for a month or two. These rate cutting cycles and liquidity injections and fiscal stimulus, this stuff goes on for a period of time. And so it builds momentum. And I think this is going to be like big time um, going forward. Again, you're doing this in the context of underinvestment, constraints in the economy, labor constraints. So I think it's going to be inflationary. This is a chart from Bloomberg, Tavi Costa, Crestcat Capital. This is global money supply, year-over-year -year change in USD billions. You see money supply is going up. Uh, this was after the COVID, uh, the pandemic stimulus of global money supply. Uh, you saw money supply was going down, bottomed in 2022. It was actually going negative. Now we're going up. I've showed this. Uh, Ronnie Stoifel shows this at Incrementum uh, Capital. I mean, a liquidity and sediment drives markets in the short term. Liquidity, liquidity, liquidity is increasing. It's going almost straight up. So anticipate what that means, tangible assets. Uh, physical dominance, we've talked about this. Um, this is the fiscal spending as a percentage non-growth percentage of physical spending derived from net interest payments social security medicare veterans benefits and services so this is 55 percent of the u.s fiscal spending is now these things that are really like not this is just transfer payments at this point okay um and this is another thing you're spending you know i think fiscal year 2024 closes out on well, Monday is the last day of the fiscal year, September 30th. The new fiscal year 2025 starts October 1st. I believe the deficit for 2024, the federal deficit's $1.9 trillion, basically 7% of GDP. If you tried to do, well, we've seen what would happen. This is why this won't happen in the US. People say, well, they should just cut, cut the deficits, blah, blah, blah. This is what Malay is doing in Argentina, and that's why the economy has contracted. Uh, this is why they had the inflation. They were spending money they didn't have. They were printing it into existence. Now, they, that's an extreme case, and it had manifested itself over several decades. But you see that what a worst case outcome. To fix it, you have to take some strong medicine. I mean, they will they stop public works projects. They've stopped every all spending, and they've got their they've got their spending now matching their uh, revenue, but the revenue is decreasing, right? Because the economy is contracting. And hopefully the, the idea is, well, can we get this under control before the, our political goodwill runs out? Because 50% of the people now in Argentina are living in poverty. And that's why, that, that's why physical austerity won't work. Because it's not politically palatable, unless you had a dictatorship or something like that. In a democracy, our system of government with a two-year and four-year election cycle, you're not going to, you take 7% of uh, the deficit spending away, the economy would collapse. And so it's print or die. That's where we're at. It's print or die um, going forward. Yes, there'll be periods of uh, when we do, when inflation, you know, I don't know what the Federal Reserve is going to do if inflation starts creeping up again. I mean, they're cutting rates, you know, why are they cutting rates? I never thought it was because they see something in the economy. I mean, the stock market was at all-time high. The labor markets, depending who you want to listen to from economists, um, Jim Bianco has one view. David Rosenberg has another view. My view is, is they're doing it because if you lower the amount of interest being paid by lowering the interest rates, you can spend money. And both of these parties and both of these presidential candidates want to spend more money. So you're at wartime levels. I've pointed this out several times. You're basically, you know, again, Luke Groman was talking about this last week on, a, on an interview that somebody interviewed him. 
what are you going to do if you get an actual recession? A typical recession, you could end up with a, you know, instead of having a $2 trillion deficit, you could have a 4 or $5 trillion deficit because of all the automatic spending that comes in place or comes into existence during a recession to support people. I mean, this is going to continue till it can't continue. And it's all leads to money printing. It all leads to erosion of the dollar as a as as a store of value and confidence this is all a confidence game okay this is why gold is going up okay this is why uh tangible assets are going up so you need to be aware of this that doesn't mean it goes straight up that doesn't mean there's going to be periods where it you know we saw that in uranium okay uh, you could have a, a washout but you know i think Overall, macroeconomically, if you look over a 10 or 20 year period, you can see what's going to happen. Again, I go back to what Felix Zuloff said three or four or five years ago. By the end of this decade, he expects the Fed's balance sheet to be $40 trillion or more. And everybody's just like, how would that happen? Well, you can see how this is going to happen or how it could possibly happen. So here's, I haven't got a chance to read this, but I like the Palm Valley Capitalist from Jesse Felder. This chart from the article, I'll put it on the uh, free site or the free email this week. Um, corporate profits versus government debts tracking, you know, since 2009, at least tracking pretty decently. So if you have all this deficit spending, you know, you take that away. What's that do to corporate profits? Well, I don't think it's going to go away, but I just think you're just going to have this continued running a low fever of, you know, four, five, six percent inflation because of the fiscal spending overspending and the inflation it's going to create with you know and then what's what happens if you take that away well it's i don't see anybody talking about taking it away and so at some point it says here we believe corporate earnings have been inflated by unsustainable growth in government debt and spending yes i agree history has been very clear about profit and market cycles built on debt they don't last. The problem with the statement like this, I think we all agree, what's the time frame? Is it next week? Is it next year? Is it five years? It's Is it tradable? Is it actionable? And I think, you know, that's why gold's been doing so well. And now I think you're going to see uh, a lot of the underlying stocks and some of these things are going to start performing as people are starting to get the message of what's happening here. So let's go back into nuclear power. I mean, the news, I mean, it's like week after week, the news just keeps getting better and better and better. And, you know, if you remember like a month ago, people were committing ritual seppuku over, you know, because, the, you know, the uranium stocks, the, re, the uranium junior I bought's not doing what I wanted to do. So here's an interview that happened with the um, CEO of NVIDIA. It says this guy, Christopher Barnard, uh, interviewed him and it is what it is it's just you know what i'm cataloging for you is the you have the ceo of oracle microsoft blackrock nvidia all these big shots all speaking from the singing from the same hymn sheet over the last couple months about nuclear power and data centers and ai and so what's the ceo of nvidia say it says I asked the CEO of NVIDIA whether we can win the AI race without building more nuclear plants. His answer, quote, it's impossible, unquote. He also congratulated Constellation Energy on their announcement to reopen Three Mile Island. So, guys, if you haven't got the memo yet, uh, this is like, this is really the most bullish thing that's happened in the last year or so. Uh, yes, I know all the other we catalog all the new installations that are happening all over the world. We're going to talk about it here. We're talking about the CDU, talking about when it gets in power in Germany, it's going to turn the reactors back on. Japanese bringing their reactors. But this whole thing where basically the corporate oligarchy in the U.S. basically has is all in now on nuclear power. Um, I don't know. You can figure out what's going to happen. It's going to happen. It is happening. So this is another thing I got off Twitter, um, this talk about Russia now. We're going to get into some serious issues. This is what I talk about when I'm talking about World War III. Yes, it's not necessarily a shooting war. The war is conducted via proxies. 
through economic warfare, financial warfare, currency warfare, all of these things. And so when somebody when a, somebody chastised me and said, World War III, what are you talking about? They're thinking about World War I or World War II or some war movie. This is what World War III is, using resources, using what you your ability to uh, box out or checkmate your adversary or your competitor. And so this is a translation. So we're talking about Russia banning uranium exports to the West. So this is a translation from another tweet. It says the government is working out, talking about the government of Russia, an extensive list of types of strategic raw materials that will be banned for export to unfriendly countries. Those are countries in the West, basically, the hegemon. According to Deputy Prime Minister Alexander Novak, it will include minerals and energy resources that are in high demand. Quote, there is a specific analysis of the situation in the world markets and Russia's capabilities. The relevant proposals will be prepared in the near future, unquote, Novak said. Then it goes on to say, it is not clear yet what specific types of raw materials we are talking about. But it seems that the list will include the so-called transition metals, in particular, uranium, nickel, and titanium. On September 11th, Vladimir Putin instructed the government to analyze the possibility of limiting the supply of these three metals to foreign markets, noting that restrictions should not be imposed as soon as, as possible, so not to harm the development of Russia. So I don't think, I think this is just a matter of when, not if. Uh, why wouldn't they... Uh, you know, you don't want to have relations with them. You want to put all these constraints on them. You want to talk about firing missiles in there. Uh, you know, I know those people on here that, you know, have a certain view that um, the West is in the right. And, you know, I don't have that view. OK, I'm not going to debate that any longer. Russia's going to win the war. OK, it's the political fallout is already starting in Europe and in the U.S. OK, they're going to win on the ground. How far the, the Europeans and the UK and the United States are willing to push this, we'll see. But on the ground, as we speak, that's what's happening. And it's inevitable. And so what are the political fallouts of that? Um, you saw what's happening in Germany with the SPD in the last three state elections. Uh, they all barely held on by one percentage point, I believe, in Brandenburg last weekend, uh, which is the SPD stronghold, supposedly. That's the area around Berlin, right? And that's been a traditional SPD, and AfD uh, came very close. And then the new par party of, around Sarah, I can't pronounce her, her last name. She's a left-of-center person who I've listened to and actually like a lot of her ideas. Uh, you know, she came out of nowhere. Her party that's basically centered around her, I think, got 13%. So you've got, you know, 43 to 45% of the people um, that didn't vote for the SPD or the CDU for these newer parties. That's telling you what's happening, okay? Political fallout in the UK, the political fallout, what happened to the conservative, the Tories totally decimated what's happened in France where Macron's trying to hold on with his little shicky Mickey things he's doing, okay? This is happening all over Europe, okay? Um, and so uh, why, why if, if you don't, if you want to destroy Russia, if you want to just, you know, this is all about political power and hegemony. That's what this is about and control of resources. That's what this is really about. I don't care what nobody in the State Department cares about democracy in Lugansk or Donetsk. What are you kidding me? Most of you people couldn't even find those on a map today, much less even heard about them two years ago. And so, you know, this is why I don't talk about that much, because I'm not interested in somebody talking to me, telling me what CNN told them to think. OK, I don't propaganda exists on both sides. OK, but you can see what's happening. A country of 140 million is going to take territory away from a country that's smaller than it. And there's nothing the West can do. The West has been totally the West is a total joke, been totally demilitarized. It has no industrial capacity. The political uh, elite are horrible, okay, and do not have the uh, interests of their people. I've talked about this ad nauseum. And so do you expect Russia and China and all the rest of these places just go along? Because why? So I think this is where we're heading. And if, and if we do this, I mean, how high does uranium go? I don't know. It'll definitely be positive.
So here we go, Sweden to ramp up nuclear power buildup. This is a new center-right government came into power recently. And so they're pushing their foot on the gas for nuclear. So Sweden, with six existing nuclear reactors generating 30% of their power, is not a rate waiting around to build more. News out that construction will begin on the next reactor before next elections in 2026 and their efforts, efforts to massively ramp up nuclear power. So we just keep getting more and more demand news. Again, where are the new greenfield mines? Forget about uh, talking about building a mine. When's somebody actually going to build one? Again, we're going to... We're, we can't increase demand for a commodity that's already undersupplied and, you know, the billions that are going to be required and the timeline, it doesn't match. We're going to run out of runway. The price is going to react. It's going to go higher. Again, I've said it before. I think there will be a come to Buddha event where somebody just has to announce we screwed up on our fuel procurement and we're going to have to derate these reactors or put them into a cold shutdown. I think that's going to happen eventually. I don't see anybody stopping building these things. I just have more and more announcements every week. Now you're talking about bringing Three Mile Island back. This other reactor in Iowa that shut down. Uh, the, uh, the reactor up in Michigan that shut down that they're going to bring back online. The, and the federal government's financing that. I mean, I, I, where's the next? Tell me in the shows with now, with the exception of another Chernobyl or meltdown or Fukushima or something like that, what is the bare case? Yet everybody a month ago was willing to, you know, hang themselves because their crappy junior didn't go, it went down 50%. This happens in resource markets. I've been saying this since this channel's been in, in effect. So psychology of market cycle, I just grabbed this. Uh, this kind of is how this goes. We're kind of in the optimism. Well, now we're getting into this between optimism, belief when the big money and you've got, you know, CNBC doing nine minute uh, things on nuclear power on fast money. When you've got all these tech billionaires coming out, this is where you're at. You're past the optimism. You're getting into belief. And I think we're going to see here in the near future, um, not necessarily next week, but, you know, in the next six months to a year, a lot of big money is going to come into this market. And I think this is going to push us into this towards this euph euphoria stage. OK, and there will be a time to sell these stocks. It's not it's not yet. OK, there'll be a time to take our profits in uranium. But we have, you know, this can go a lot longer. You know, But this is where I think we're at. We're past the optimism. Everybody gets it. We're now now we have validation by the media, by the big money, by the tech sector, by the oligarchy, by the real players that have hundreds of billions of dollars. OK and are all singing from the same, same hymn sheet that there will be no AI revolution. There will be no data centers without nuclear power. It's that simple. So from US uh, global investors, gold, one of the top performing assets of 2024 so far, it's up 27.4% this year. That's beating the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, and the S&P World Index. Uh, so there you go. Uh, there's a reason why this is Money Fest 2024. Central bank gold demand, highest on record. Central bank gold demand in the first half of the year was the highest on record. There you go. We haven't even got a lot of retail coming in. That's starting to happen now. Um, you see what's, what's, what's happening here, guys. Holdings and fiscal gold ETFs. I mean, they put together this 200-day moving average and 50-day. I mean, I guess you could put technical analysis. I just found this interesting that basically, yeah, it's starting, okay? Money's going to start coming back. Why the flywheel, the FOMO, the media attention? Price begets attention, which begets higher prices, which begets more attention. You know, there you go. And then people start looking, well, I can't afford $2,700 for a gold ounce, but maybe I can buy a few shares of Anglo gold or whatever, what have you. You see, you see how this starts manifesting? And so I think being patient and understanding that if this rise in the gold price is sustainable, which I believe it's broken out, we're going to make new all-time highs going forward in real terms eventually over the space of this decade, 
the gold stocks are going to follow. Certain. That doesn't mean just go out and just buy any. Again, there's no reason at this point to go out and just buy XYZ Junior Moose Pasture in Saskatchewan. The quality companies that are cash flowing are still cheap. That's what you buy. And then you eventually graduate as this bull market gets going. Then you can graduate go lower and lower down the food chain. Okay? Because if you buy the juniors right now that don't have anything going on, I think you'll eventually make money, but you're going to have a lot of volatility. You can limit your volatility and you can participate in this without going nuts. And you want cash flow. I like cash flow. I guess I'm just because I'm becoming old and crotchety. Uh, I like cash flow. And so at twenty six fifty or $2,700, wherever in that range of gold price, and I think moving higher over time, uh, you know, we're kind of in a sweet spot right now because energy prices, oil prices are actually down, which is inexplicable, but that's good for if you're a mining operation because a lot of your costs are diesel. And if the oil price is going down, but the gold price is going up, you're going to be in the cuckoo bird seat. Your, your, your variable cost, your fuel cost, which consumes a large portion of your budget, I mean, upwards of 40 or 50% in some mines, uh, and that's down, that's cash flow that hits the bottom line. Indian gold import surge, inbound shipments jump as tax cuts juice demand ahead of the festival season. I mean, we have coming up on the festival season in India, in, as India gets wealthier, that you know they have an affinity for gold. I mean, here you go. I mean, it's just again, this is setting up now nicely for us. And so another Porter Stansberry uh, quote. I didn't used to like this guy, but I've learned a lot about him and read a lot of his stuff and listened to him on podcasts. He's actually a pretty pretty decent guy, pretty smart, uh, and pretty. Uh, uh, savvy uh investor i kind of you know he built basically a publishing financial publishing empire starting out at a kitchen table and a laptop and so that says something was worth you know a couple hundred million dollars is what i understand so anyways what's he say our entire economy now depends on endless money printing and malinvestment what's the malinvestment okay spending money for defense to fight in Russia in Donbass, that was stupid. Trying to outcompete Taiwanese and Chinese on chips in Arizona, that's dumb. Uh, the Green New Deal, dumb. Anyways, 1.5 trillion for worthless degrees. Yep, gender studies, that's so you can work at Starbucks as a barista. Remember the debt forgiveness, right? That's just wasted money. 2.3 trillion for a lost war. Who pays? Main Street Americans, who profits? The elites. This ends in monetary collapse. Uh, yes, it will eventually. Again, how is it actionable? You got to put a time frame on it. But as long as we get the general trend, which we are on, I think we're going to do fine. Um, again, there'll be volatility. There'll be times when we'll question our sanity, like a lot of people did in the Iranian market. But I don't see anybody maybe with the exception of Rand Paul and Thomas Massey, I don't see anybody on the DNC side, Democratic side, talking about fiscal responsibility and cutting spending. Uh, and both these presidential candidates are MMTers. They're just going to spend money. Nothing's going to change under either one of them. And so here you go. Spending money we don't have, uh, it's slow erosion. You know, there's a lot of ruin in a country, as Adam Smith said. So this doesn't happen overnight. That's the mistake people make because they don't know history. It took several hundred years for Rome to be eroded. Now, people say, well, it will happen faster now because we have the Internet. Like I said, there's a lot of ruin. There's a lot of you're still living off the inertia of our previous generations that created the system. that's slowly being eroded as they add more regulations and more, uh, you know, shicky Mickey and more. Uh, rules and taxes and fees and uh, nonsense, okay? And as the pe people become less virtuous and don't even want to work. I mean, I could tell you stories. I, I, I drive between Harlingen and McAllen, which is 30 minutes on the freeway, and I counted the other day 16 personal injury billboard advertisements. 
Okay. And some of them are so corny, it's unbelievable. And that's the majority of the billboards is for personal injury. If you're in an accident, call me. So everybody is on the take. I just saw that uh, uh, one of these clowns that was uh, on this uh, gaudy outfit, uh, one of the kids that was on that show living with the gaudies, remember that, I don't know, this clown got just got a sentence for uh, stealing from the PPP. That 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 was happening during COVID. Everybody was stealing. Every, everybody's out to just grab whatever they can. That's what I mean by people not being virtuous. Disability fraud, Medicare fraud. You come down here, EBT, Medicare, all these frauds that go on in South Texas. You don't even have a clue, okay, or what I saw in West Virginia, okay? So everybody's on the take. Everybody's grabbing what they can. Nobody wants to work. Nobody wants to get rich slowly. Everybody wants to get rich quick. So this is a problem. And so money printing enables this bad behavior. It, it, it aids and abets this uh, malinvestment. And so, again, I can't do anything. I'm not king. No one cares what I say. I'm just some old guy yelling on my front lawn, yelling at the moon. So what do I have to do? I have to look at things for the way they are and then position myself for looking historically because this is nothing new there's nothing new under the sun as solomon said this has all happened before throughout history many many empires have caused themselves to dissolve because of the exact same thing that we're doing okay and then you can see what the results are okay and so this is i don't see anything on the horizon that's going to change this and so expect more money printing more malinvestment higher gold prices lower standards of living and people going gee how is this happening you know and so you know yet we have a more we have two morons running for president neither one of them know anything about economic policy one of them is a complete zero at okay and uh see i'm not naming names i'm gonna let you determine which one you think in your mind but you know there's there th th that's not how you're going to solve these problems people are going to write decline and fall of the american empire down the line there'll be another gibbon that writes that and they'll write chapters about these morons that were in leadership and how we gave the whole store away to uh you know the oligarchy and these corrupt people but that's uh, that's for another day our job is to look at things for the way they are and using probability and where can we position capital to protect ourselves from uh, these deprivations? Okay, that's it for this week, guys. I appreciate the uh, support. Again, support me. You know, if you don't, you know, we got the free emails that I put out. Basically, in that, I talk about what I'm reading that week, what podcasts, articles, uh, interviews. Uh, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not the best. Um, but it's free. It gives you an introduction. A lot of times I'll give some commentary in there about these exact things we're talking about and these trends that we're talking about and whether there anything's changing. And then, you know, eventually that leads most people to the paid newsletter. It's like, okay, how can I actually take advantage of this? What companies or what situations or what countries uh, are undervalued? Where can I go to, to get a return? And so that's what the paid newsletter is for. So avail yourself of that. Again, you know, like, comment, subscribe to the channel. It helps us out with the algorithm. And we want to get this, we want to get this out. I want to grow my business. So I'm going to ask for your help on that. Uh, we, I spent a lot of time and effort putting this together. Help us out any way you can. Appreciate it. All right, guys, talk to you next week. Thank you.